About two years ago, the congregation here at West Hill began supporting the uh, David Tarbot and his wife Paula in the northeast and around Connecticut and the outlying areas from that uh, uh, from Connecticut. We uh, are blessed tonight to have David and Paula with us. We're thankful that he has been able to come down and give us a report. Of course, you'll remember last year he came uh, just days after the Sandy Hook massacre and uh, had some very insightful things to say about that, having come from that area. And here we are coming up on the one-year anniversary of that. And so we're thankful that uh, to have the Tarbots with us, and we want to give him the floor and, and uh, preach the gospel to us. Brother David. It's a privilege to be with you tonight, and I was thinking about a passage that came from the book of Philippians, and I'd like to share some thoughts briefly with you out of this passage, and then give you a report on how our work is going in the northeastern United States. I noticed in your bulletin that you have us down as being in a foreign country. Uh, I think a lot of people think that the northeast is a foreign country. But it is indeed a part of our United States and greatly in need of, of those who preach the gospel and those who obey the gospel. But in the book of Philippians chapter 1, Paul writes to the church at Philippi, I thank my God every time I remember you and my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I hope that you consider that the work that you're involved with in helping us be in Connecticut is a good work that God began in you and that you are confident that God will continue to bless your work and bring it to completion on the day of Jesus Christ, the day he returns. And the last chapter of this book, Philippians chapter 4, Paul returns to the subject, and I'd like to share these verses with you from chapter 4, beginning in verse 14. It was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I'm looking for a gift, but I am looking for what will be credited to your account. I have received full payment and even more." I think it's intriguing that Paul uses the terms of commerce in the last chapter here. He talks about things being in an account, and we know what that means to have bank accounts and deposits that are made there and credits that are put on our bank statements and uh, withdrawals that are placed on our bank statements. This is the language that Paul is using. He's talking about accounts and about things that are being credited to the account. Now what is it that we have as our account? Well, we have a heavenly bank account, and we are making deposits into that account on a regular basis. And Paul said, the deposits that you're making into your account that will be credited to you personally and individually in the heavenly bank is the work that you are helping me do and have helped me do from the first day. For even in Thessalonica you sent aid to me time and again. And I want you to know that in God's heavenly bank you have an account and the work that you're involved in in supporting missionaries in various places is being deposited to your account. And God is a very good banker. He is trustworthy, totally reliable, and he will make sure that you get a good return on all of the deposits that you place in the heavenly bank. So that's what Paul is saying. You've just come through a year in which you emphasized evangelism, 
And that is so important. And now you're about ready to go into a new year in which you're going to be emphasizing all of the members of the church involved in the Lord's work in one way or another. <clears throat> and just remember that everything you do for the Lord is a deposit. It's going to your account, your personal account. And one of these days, the day of the Lord Jesus, you will receive your reward for what you've done to serve the Lord here on the earth in this good church with good elders and with good people. Well, with that in mind, let me tell you a little bit about the work that you're involved in through us in Connecticut. We try to spend eight months of the year in the Northeast helping the church mostly in New Milford, Connecticut where our son Tim does the preaching and I do other things that preachers need to do in the mission field, which I'll share with you this evening. And then we spend some time working with churches outside of Connecticut, but still in the Northeast to further the cause of Christ. Then we come down to Texas to get warm and you had a nice storm to welcome us here. But God is good and he allows us to serve him wherever we are at whatever time and place we happen to be. And hopefully we're continuing to serve him during this time that we're in Texas during the winter months. When we arrived back in New Milford, Connecticut, we arrived at a small congregation. On Sunday morning, Bible class attendance was running around 17. And the morning worship service was running about 30. And they're good people. They love the Lord and they're serving the Lord in that community. One day I received an email from a lady up in Vermont. And she said, my grandmother lives in New Milford, Connecticut. She is 93 years of age and the doctor has told her that she is going to die soon. My grandmother was baptized into Christ by Carrie Holton back in 1978, but she didn't remain faithful very long, and so she's been out of the church for a number of years now, and she wants to make things right with God and get back into the church again. So Paula and I went to see her in the nursing home, and she expressed to us that was indeed what she wanted to do, in this last few moments of um, her life. And so she was restored. I, don't you remember that Isaiah promised us in chapter 55 that God's word does not return void? Sometimes it takes years for that word to work in the hearts of people and bring them around to the Lord's will. But in this case, it had been so many years after her baptism and the Word of God was still at work in her conscience and in her heart. And when she got ready to meet the Lord, she knew what she needed to do. And so after all of those years, she was restored to the Lord. Shirley lived about three months after that day. And now she's gone on to be with the Lord and to be with Him Forever. We look forward to the day when we get to be with our sister Shirley once again. The church in New Milford, being small like it is, is one of several congregations in the northeastern states that are about the same size. And uh, the singing is not always very, very great to human ears in small congregations. And uh, New Milford is not particularly an exception to that. And we decided that what we would do was to invite folks from other small congregations around us within about an hour, an hour and a half's driving distance to come over and have a Sunday afternoon singing. And so they began to come. And, and they came from Bridgeport, Connecticut, and from Torrington, Connecticut, and from Poughkeepsie, New York, and Danbury, Connecticut, and we had a wonderful time singing. The singing was the greatest singing that most of those people had ever heard in their lives. And, uh, you know, 
when you're living in a small church and you don't hear good singing, it just is absolutely overwhelming to you to hear all the voices praising God. I was preaching in Rhode Island earlier this, this year, and uh, the preacher said, you know, in our small congregation, we've had two visitors this year who've offered to buy us a piano. And one of them, uh, I said to her, no, we, we don't use the piano uh, because we just stick with what the Bible says and, and we sing like the Bible says. And she said, well, sir, do you realize that when you sing in this church, you sound like a bunch of cats? And he said, well, ma'am, I would rather sound like a bunch of cats and please the Lord than to sound beautiful and not please the Lord. I thought that was a pretty good answer to give to her. So she decided to withdraw her offer and to withdraw her attendance as well. But that's the way it is in the northeastern United States when you gather with small congregations they don't always sound beautiful in their singing. In April of this year something really wonderful happened to the church in New Milford, Connecticut. A young family by the name of Wyatt and Jatana Winken uh, Werder moved into the New Milford area. He works for an oil company and and they purchased a house, and they have two little children. And they came from Pearland, Texas. How many of you know where Pearland, Texas is? Some of you are from the Houston area, so you know Pearland. And we were thrilled to have a new family move in. The corporations don't move many people around anymore like they used to 15 years or 20 years ago. And so we get very few families moving in to the Northeast who are members of the church. And especially a young family with two little children. And you know in New Milford we didn't have children that are below the upper elementary levels and high school really, junior high school and high school. And so we didn't have a need for Bible classes on Sunday for any kids that were younger than that. And uh, so the 1st of May, we decided that we would start a Bible class for preschool kids, especially for this family that had moved in from Texas. And I went down to the Toys R Us and bought a table and bought four little chairs. And we had three kids to show up that first Sunday. One is a family with a little girl that had never they, they had never intended to bring her to Sunday school. She would have been the only one there anyway, but now that we have two others, her parents say we want her to be in part of the Bible classes as well. And so we began our second class for children in Bible classes on Sunday morning. Well, the Winken Worders have an unusual name. He came out of Catholicism when they married years ago here in Texas. And in my research on the history of the English Bible, there was a very important printer of English Bibles in the 1500s by the name of Winken de Werder. And uh, somewhere back through all of their ancestry, I bet that they are related. Both of them are people who love the Bible. Well, as the year progressed, our Bible class attendance began to climb, and sometimes there was a difference of only two people between the number that came for Bible class and the number that came for worship. So the church was growing spiritually as it was growing numerically. On Thursday evenings of every other week, our son Tim goes down to the local Starbucks and teaches a Bible class there. I think I probably mentioned this to you a year ago that he had an opportunity to take over a Bible study that was held in Starbucks and it was led by a man who was not a member of the church, an evangelical uh, layman, and he had people from various churches that were gathering in Starbucks and they had their coffee and their Bible study on Thursdays. Tim walked in one Thursday evening and 
heard them and saw them reading their Bibles in public like that. And he walked over and he asked if he could join. So he joined their Bible study. And after a few weeks, the leader said, Tim, I really want to do something different from this. And I need somebody to take over this study. So would you do it? So Tim took over the Bible study. One couple that has continued to be there every time that class meets is a couple from the community who go to a conservative Protestant church in the community. And they just keep coming and keep studying and keep learning. Recently, I gave a copy of a book called Tulip to the husband in that family. Tulip stands for the five major points of Calvinism. The T is for total depravity. The U is for unconditional election. That is that God elects the saved and it's unconditional. You're just going to make it without any meeting any conditions. The L stands for limited atonement. That is that Jesus only died for the people that have been unconditionally elected to go to heaven. And he's got that all worked out who those people are. So he only died for them. And the uh, I stands for irresistible grace. If you're among the elected that Jesus died for, you are going to receive God's grace irresistibly. You could not be lost if you wanted to be lost. You're going to have to go to heaven whether you ever thought about it or not because that God's grace is irresistible and he died for you and you're among the elect that's going to make it after being born totally depraved. And then the P stands for the perseverance of the saints which we usually refer to as once saved, always saved. So I said to this man that day, I'd like for you to read this book because it explores those five major points of Calvinism. And I think it will help you in your Bible study to see what the Bible teaches on those subjects. And as far as I know, he's never bothered to open the book and read it. I think he's afraid to read it because he's learning so much now in his Bible study on Thursday nights that he'd never heard before that he may feel like he's not ready for some big bomb to be dropped in his lap. But that's what it will be when he reads that book and comes to see that those five points of Calvinism are not taught in the Word of God. But I'd like for you to pray for those people that their hearts will be open and that they will begin a study of that important religious concept that underlies so much of conservative evangelical Protestantism in America today. Paula has opportunity from time to time to speak to ladies and uh, once a year the church uh, has a lectureship in the Boston area and people gather from all the six New England states and New York and New Jersey and uh, Paula taught a class there for the ladies this past this year on passing the torch and I've been invited to be the keynote speaker this year on the subject of getting back to the basics. Now I don't know how you feel about that subject but I think that's a very important subject. As I travel around I see that many of our pulpits are silent on the basics and the things that we used to hear and we were convicted of, we don't hear that much in many places, and now when we don't hear those sermons, something happens. One is our young people grow up and they have no idea what the basics are, and the older people forget, as older people do. So it's to our harm that we are neglecting to preach and teach on the one church and on how you become a Christian and respect for the authority of Scripture and respect for the silence of Scripture and things like that that form the basics of who God's people are. I'm going to be teaching on that subject come in May of this year at the Boston Lectureship and uh, I appreciate your prayers for that as well. As Vacation Bible School began to get
get closer to us. Uh, we were planning for the church, the Bridgewood Church in Fort Worth, to send up young people and adults to help us with VBS, which they did, and they did a marvelous job of conducting Vacation Bible School. Everything was just planned out just like it ought to be, and we'd spent several weeks preparing by inviting people to attend, and this year Vacation Bible School drew the largest number of outside families that have, as far as I know, have ever attended Vacation Bible School in the church in New Milford. You know, on Sunday nights, the church in New Milford meets, just like you do here on Sunday night. But most churches of Christ in the Northeast do not have Sunday night services. And as far as I know, no church of any kind in New Milford, Connecticut has a Sunday night service. So if you don't get to church on Sunday morning in New Milford, Connecticut, you're out of luck until the next Sunday morning comes around, except for the New Milford Church of Christ. And you can come on Sunday night if you've had to work or otherwise been hindered from going on Sunday morning, and you'll hear the gospel taught. One man began to bring his son, his teenage son. Tom is a grocer, and he works on Sunday mornings, raised a Baptist, but he wanted to go to church. So when one of his co-workers told him that we have a Sunday night service, he came. And uh, he said later, I really kind of wondered about you folks. You don't have any instruments in your singing, and I wasn't sure about you. But I, he kept coming, and as he kept coming, he... He began to learn, and one day he said, my friend is a Catholic, and, and she would like to come with me on Sunday night. Could, could she do that? And so she began to come, and uh, so they both are now learning, and it wasn't too long until through a series of home Bible studies, uh, both Tom and Phyllis obeyed the gospel. And the night that they were baptized into Christ, they announced that they were engaged also to be married. Now, we are thankful for those two souls that have been brought to the Lord this year. Memorial Day in the Northeast is a big deal. Towns and villages are built around the green. All the first churches are built around the green and the shops are around the green. And this is the area that's all green grass and trees right down in the heart of the town. And every town of any size has a parade on Memorial Day. And the fire trucks are there and the school kid bands and, and uh, all the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts and any other public organization is marching in the parade. Now Tim has been a Cub Scout leader for a number of years and and uh, we knew that our, our grandson Jonathan and our granddaughter Rebecca uh, would be marching in the parade. And so we went down uh, over to one end of the green and just waited for their group to come around with their float and pass in front of us. All of a sudden, a man started running up the street and he yelled out to another man, There's a kid! that fell off the float, and the float ran over him. Well, you know, you look over there, and you don't see your grandson, and you don't see your son, and you just sort of wonder. So I just sort of ambled over that way just to see what was going on. And when I got over there, it was our grandson, sure enough. And he didn't fall off the float, he was walking too close to the float and he tripped on something and his leg went under the float. And when everybody started yelling and screaming, the man that was driving the float thought he better back up. So he backed up and went over the leg for the second time. And they called the ambulance and the ambulance came and, and took him off to the hospital. And then the man who's in charge of the whole parade just canceled the rest of the activities for the day. The doctor took x-rays of Jonathan's leg and said there's no broken bones. We were thankful for that. Now every year the church has a picnic right after the parade at the local park. So at 
the end of the parade, we made our way over to the park after we checked on Jonathan, and we went over there to, to be with our Christian family. And uh, two families, three families, that had been involved with our son Tim and with our grandson Jonathan in the Cub Scouts wanted to show support for Jonathan, and they came to the parade, uh, to the picnic. So we had the three families that were not members of the church and no connection with the church at the, per, at the picnic. And we were glad to have them. And I want to tell you tonight that two of those families are now in the church. Two of them are coming every Sunday and the mother of one of the Cub Scouts has obeyed the gospel. And the other one is very interested. She said to Tim the other day, Tim, I just feel like that this is going to be my church. Well, it's amazing how God can take bad things and produce good things out of the bad things. And so that's what happened on Memorial Day of this year. In the meantime, the Bible class attendance is continuing to increase. And by the end of the summer, Bible class attendance has increased 80% from what it was in March of this year. And the Sunday morning worship attendance is increasing as well. And the church is encouraged, and now we need another Bible class to start for school-age children. And so the mother who was of the Cub Scout who obeyed the gospel said, I would be glad to help out in any way I can. What can I do in the church to help? And we said, well, we need to have a teacher for this new class. When we know you don't have any experience, would you be willing to sit in with the person who does have experience as a teacher and learn how to teach? She said, I will be there. And she has been there every Sunday and learning how to be a Bible class teacher on Sunday mornings for the class of kids who are in the elementary grades. So now we've got three Bible classes going, preschoolers, elementary, junior high, and senior high together, and the adult class as well. The church has picnics three times a year at that park, all on holidays. The first one is Memorial Day. And the next one is July the 4th, and the last one is Labor Day. These are all very patriotic holidays in New England. And this last one on Labor Day, we had three families, again, that were not members of the church. On Friends Day in October, we had 33 in Bible classes and 44 in worship services. And we would have had more, but some of the members were out of town on that weekend. But we were greatly encouraged. I mentioned earlier to you that I try to help uh, the church in other places outside of New Milford and other states. And so uh, I was called upon at one point during the year to go to um, New Hampshire and teach a group of men who are aspiring to be leaders in the church. And the subject that was given to me to teach all day on Saturday was the Church of Christ. And so I taught things that every Christian needs to know. The origin of the church, the establishment of the church, the name of the church, how you become a member of the church, the organization of the church, the mission of the church, the worship of the church. And I hope that that helps those men to understand that when they get in the pulpit to preach, they have something to say that nobody else in their community is preaching on the church that Jesus built and what it's like. Up in, New Mil up in Torrington, Connecticut, their preacher was out of town. They asked me to preach, and I decided to preach on instrumental music. I am just very concerned that uh, our people understand why we have only vocal music and not instrumental music, and they're not going to understand if we don't preach on it. And uh, so I decided that this day that's what I would do, and, and I did. And in the audience was a young man who is a graduate of 
one of our Christian colleges, and for the last few years he has been connected with the Christian church. And he heard that lesson, and afterwards he said, I am going to go back to my Christian church, and I'm going to teach them what the Bible says about worship and respect for the silence of God with regards to vocal music and no instrumental music. And so I hope he did, and I think that he's attending more now in that congregation than he has perhaps on some occasions in the past. And I hope that what he does is to tell people that when God reveals what he wants, he doesn't have to tell us not to do something else. His silence about something else is golden. And it's for that reason that we don't sprinkle for baptism because what God said he wants is immersion. And he never condemns sprinkling. You'll, you'll search your Bible from cover to cover. There's not one place in there that God ever says you shall not sprinkle for baptism. He's silent on that subject. And he didn't feel like he needed to address that subject when he told us what he wanted. And for the same reason, we don't pray to the saints and marry. Even if the Pope does supposedly heal a few people after he becomes a saint, we don't believe in that and we don't participate in that. And the reason is that God has told us that our mediator is Jesus. And when he said that, he didn't have to say, you shall not pray to the saints. You shall not pray to Mary. He didn't need to because he told us what we are to do. His silence about prayers to anybody else is golden. And with regards to the music of worship, God never had to say, you shall not use instrumental music. But he told us what to do. He said, sing and make melody in your heart to the Lord from Ephesians 5, and when God told us what he wanted in regards to music, he didn't need, he didn't thought, think he needed to go beyond and say, and I don't want some other kind of music. You shall not use a different kind of music, because he felt he didn't need to do that. He didn't say you shall not have a different kind of baptism, or that you should have, not have a different kind of mediator in prayer. He just told us what he wanted, and the door that will bring instrumental music into Christian worship is the same door that can bring in prayers to the Pope or the saints. It is the same door that can bring in sprinkling for baptism. If there any of them are wrong, they're all wrong because they're not authorized in the Word of God. And I have decided that when I preach from time to time at other places like in Manchester, Connecticut, where we have a good, solid church, probably the largest church in New England is in that community, I would preach on that again. And I had people come up to me afterwards and say, we didn't understand that. Nobody's ever explained it to us before. So I think we shouldn't take it for granted that people understand the importance of the principle where the Bible speaks, we speak. And where the Bible is silent, we are silent. God continues to bless the work in New Milford, Connecticut, and your efforts are paying off. Your investments that you're making there in Heaven's bank account is being credited on your account and may God continue to bless you as he's blessed us as we look forward to the day of reckoning when we will receive God's reward for faithful service. The last uh, few months, I've been conducting seminars on how we got the Bible. Over a number of years, Paul and I have collected rare Bibles from the 1500s and the 1600s. 
And we bring these Bibles, it takes two hours to set them all up, and teach on how we got the Bible. Did you know that people died that you and I could read the Bible in English? And that if they hadn't died, maybe we wouldn't have had the Bible in English at all. And most of us have never seen Bibles that old, 500 years old. And so these Bibles are put on display. Members of the church invite their friends from outside the church. The church supports this work and area congregations announce it and their members come and support it. And in New Milford, when I did it there, we had three families start coming to church as a direct result of the seminar on how we got the Bible. One man said to me, I've never heard this before. Another man said to me one day, well, my view of how we got the Bible is sort of like this. It's like a game of gossip. You start out over here and you whisper a message into the person's ear, and by the time it goes all the way around the circle and gets back, it's a different message from the way it started. And that's what I think has happened to the Bible. Two things in people's minds have corrupted the Bible and given the impression that what we have today is not the same as that was first given. The one is the passing of time. It's been 2,000 years since the Bible was given and normally you expect that things will change over 2,000 years. And secondly, translating it from one language into another language has got to lead to some corruption of the message. So a lot of people think that we don't really need to be excited about what the Bible says. It's not the same Bible anyway, and so we don't get too interested in learning it. But is it true that our Bibles have been corrupted? In the seminar, one of the sessions is the preservation of the ancient scripture. I am fully convinced that the evidence is this that when you pick up your Bible and read it, you are reading exactly what was written by Paul and Peter and Jude and John and Matthew and Mark and Luke and any other writer of the Old or the New Testament. So the seminar is a faith building thing. It's attractive to outsiders. When I held it in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, they had 15 non-members from the community come to the first session. A lady in New Milford, Connecticut was baptized last week as a result of the seminar that was held a few months back. A man in Pittsburgh is coming every Sunday to church as a result of what he learned about how we got the Bible. So pray for that, too, if you would, that God will use it to build up his church in the Northeast and wherever people have an opportunity to hear the story. Yes. Now tonight, it may be that in our midst there's someone who needs to give their lives to Christ, and we want to give you the opportunity this evening to do that. If you are a believer in Jesus, by turning from your sins and confessing Jesus as Lord, and being baptized by immersion, your sins will be washed away and God will add you to his church. I read today on a website of a congregation that claims to be Christ's church that what you need to do is confess your sins. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says if you confess Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. So we're not asking you to tell us what your sins are. That's between you and God. But what we expect of ourselves and you is that we courageously say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Our words to that effect. 
And so if tonight you're ready to give your life to Jesus and have the courage to confess Him and are willing to turn from your sins in repentance, you can be baptized tonight while we stand together and while we sing.